Go. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Senate Education. It's 117. Ms. Richter, mind joining us at the table? Yeah. Fiscal note. Uh, we have Ms. St. James with us. And the one name not on the agenda, the last minute edition, was uh, Sue Minter, who represents, I believe, organizations, the parent education programs that um, Senator Perfect is trying to address in this bill. So she's going to join us. But Ms. Richter, if you don't mind, I'm going to just ask the council, since she's here, to say, James, 100,000 feet, can you just tell us again what this bill does? Sure, Beth. St. James Office of Legislative Council. Um, this bill <clears throat> amends what's currently in session law. Um, teen parent education programs currently receive 83% of the prior year's statewide average net cost per pupil. And this bill would move that to 100%. It would also um, allow um, time that a pupil attending a teen parent education program is absent due to giving and recovering from birth. Um, for that time that that person was out um, to be counted towards a full-time equivalent enrollment calculation. So those absences wouldn't be counted against them. Any questions? Yeah, Sponsor the bill, Senator Perchel again. I believe we have Senator Kitchell interested in doing something, perhaps in the budget, but we want to hear from Joint Fiscal as well as uh, Sue Minter today. So, floor Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, Director Emily Richter with the Joint Fiscal Office. I see that the committee has my fiscal note or the fiscal note in front of them. Also, it's posted on the committee's webpage under my name. A short fiscal note. Um, so really, as Beth from like council just walked through, it's increasing that um, amount that a teen parent program would receive from the from the pupil school district of residence from what it currently is of 83 percent of the prior year's statewide average net cost per pupil without debt to 100 percent. Um, and so really, we estimate this bill would result in in an increased cost of approximately 130,000 to the education fund in fiscal year 2024, but this would be a, a de minimis impact. Um, so I can talk in any more detail as would be helpful to the committee. Uh, questions or comments? Mr. Francis. Well, I, was, I wasn't raising my I know, but I was told you have some concerns about it. It's not a concern per se. Okay. Um, so I was caught by off guard with regard to this bill coming up the way it did this week. I reached out to one superintendent who's been a superintendent for a long time and asked about the source of the 83% versus 100%. Okay. And as I understand it, 16 VSA 1073 little i leaves some elements of the services to the student with the school district. So the distribution between 100% and 83% was really an acknowledgement that the school district was not going to leave the student entirely to the uh, teen parent program. Okay. They were going to continue to provide services. So, um, so the superintendent with whom I spoke raised that point and said, and I'm not sure that I agree with the superintendent, and it was a very quick exchange, but they said, okay, if the Pay, if the tuition would go to 100%, yeah. then the planning, coordination, and assessment of the student's progress should go to the pregnant teen center as well. And I don't know that teen centers that are set up to provide services to students who are there because they're pregnant either have an interest or a capacity to pro provide those kinds of educational yeah. services. So to wrap it up, so there, so there was a rationale to 83%. And I just wanted to make sure, really, without any um, <coughs> negative comment about the intent of the bill, that wanted to let you know that that's what the reason was. 
that individual happen to give you any sense of what it is that they generally are kind of holding on now? No, and I think, if I may, yeah. I think that the fiscal note is illustrative of why not, right? So there's not a lot of money involved. Yeah. Um, I recall these conversations because um, I, I was involved, you know, it might have been 15 or 20 years ago. I didn't check the, the source <laughs> and the statutes to see when the last time this conversation happened. But um, it was at a time like today when there was always an interest in what the distribution of obligation was going to be between school districts. So long winded way of saying there's fiscal pressures at the time. So there was an interest in 100% at that time as well. And it got worked out to 83% because the school was going to continue to provide services to the students. Do you know if it's safe to say that we'll hear from Sue Mister that well, this is the case for all of the school districts? Everybody's still doing something, whether it's evaluating. Okay. Yeah, and and I was asked that by Ms. Zimmerman, um, who's here. You know, she works with us, and I I don't know the answer to that question either for the school districts or the teen parent centers. So I think there's a potential that the teen parent centers may offer a, a variable level of service for the um, for the students that they're serving. So you know I'd sum it up and well, I'll still answer questions, but it seemed to me like a it's a good point on both sides. And um, and the point that I'm here to represent is the fact that school districts are still providing services to these kids. So. Any questions for uh, Joint Fiscal Director, Mr. Francis, or Best St. James before we hear from Sue? Have we done a walkthrough? We did. We had to the sponsor center for the candidate, okay. so it's yeah. a little. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Please. Uh, just, it just occurred to me because I'm racking my brain here. Um, the last time this was discussed, Michael Fisher was the director of the Addison County um, Teen Parent Center. So whatever that was, you know, he moved on to the health yeah. arena, but he was in that position at the time. Advocating for this. It, it wasn't really advocacy. It was more working it out. OK. Anything else? How much money? No. The scheme of things. So when, when thinking about the statewide education fund, it would be the minimus. Yeah. yeah. We'll hear again from uh, Sue Mentor, who will outline as soon as she pops on the screen, why, how this will make a difference for. I don't think we need you to stick around. All right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank great you all. Good to yeah. see you. Thank, Thank you. you. We're just waiting for Sue to get started. Uh, while we're waiting, gentlemen, do you want to talk about buses? Okay, mm -hmm. come on. Yeah, go ahead. You want to try to summarize or uh, We had a request from the Toy Development School. Okay. Uh, which is a new business school. Okay. And they, they requested some funding so they can buy a uh, 15,000 van. Not funding. Hmm? No funding. Huh? Okay, just a code change. Okay. A code change that would allow them to purchase the van, or so, so they're to to buy. So apparently, U.S. government during COVID mm -hmm. segmented vehicle purchases, and they needed to buy a to buy uh, a van that's uh, greater than uh, twelve. Uh, this was the original rule. Uh, you needed a government PIN code, financial, that's not broken down, anyway, something, identification number or something, to be authorized to be able to buy a van that supports a school. So, so production was slowed down, distribution of vans, uh, high capacity, or in this case, you know, greater than 12, was, um, was, was controlled by the government very closely. So, so that so that these vehicles only went to high priority uh, organizations like schools. Okay. Anyway, so this this school, independent school, uh, in Killington, 
I was looking to buy a 10 passenger van, but still apparently falls within the, um, the requirement to have a fin, you know, US government fin code uh, to be able to purchase the van. And being an independent school, they're not authorized to, to receive a fin code. Is that, is that federal? I mean, how do they? Federal. Yeah. All right. So, 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 so we, uh, I don't, yeah. So we, we in our, well, I shouldn't say, okay, let me, let me knock off that it's US government, it just says government fin code. So apparently that keeps it in our wheelhouse. Um, and, so it's they're just looking to utilize uh, uh, resources in this case uh, access to vehicles like uh, like uh, like in, like any public like a public school like a public school but in our statutes we separate between government uh, state sponsored uh, uh, state sponsored schools and and, uh, and independent schools we differentiate. So what they're looking at doing, again, so this is like you know, 30 minutes ago. So I'm not really well versed on it, but the, na the nature of it is they're looking for a statute change that allows independent schools to also receive, uh, also receive access to the government. So are you going to be putting in a bill to change the statute? Uh, I'm not sure yet. I'm okay. just, it's just an interesting concept. They got an email. I thought oh, okay. let's just talk about. Uh, this is just like a, a pop off. Okay, I'm just curious about the process. Be so. for the miscellaneous bill. That's exactly it. So yeah. the, the theory is that uh, yeah. in, our, in the House and miscellaneous bill, we change language, which essentially authorizes an independent school to also access the government, uh, uh, be able to utilize the, uh, the government debt code. That's as much as I know about it at this point. Uh, Maybe work with Beth to see if. <laughs> I mean, just because I don't know anything about it. If anybody's yeah. no, know something it, about it, it, frankly, it strikes me as odd that in independent school, it feels like they've been buying buses forever, I would think. I mean, this isn't the first yeah, but, time. But, but the pandemic changed the time. Uh, okay. Maybe Beth can help right. us navigate whether or not this is a state issue or a federal issue. Yeah, I would need a lot more information okay. than that. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm happy to look at whatever you have. Or the email to the same James. The same thing. So I, I apologize for the lack of clarity. No. But, but I just ask for, you know, process wise, it's yeah. all. Yeah, that's very helpful. Ms. Minter, thanks for joining us. Hello, Senators. Thank you for inviting me. Let me tell you where where we're at with this, if you can uh, perhaps help us. Senator Firstlick came in a few weeks ago with this bill, and uh, always it seems like an easy bill. Uh, and we just heard from Joint Fiscal that it wouldn't cost the state very much to move in this direction. We're also uh, pleased to have this director of the Superintendents Association, Jeff Francis, in the room, who also has just, frankly, I think, reminded us some of the history around this, that this was, you know, done because, you know, the split was done in part, or largely, or entirely, because the, the, the public schools were still providing services to these students. And so the split, the 83%, seemed to make sense. Uh, and so we don't want to, frankly, just for, this is how I feel, I don't want to take money away from the public schools if they are indeed still providing some services. And so that is sort of where we're at. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, certainly I would love just to explain a little bit about our program and yeah. if that's what you're asking. And I do want to recognize that the director of our high school this is called the Brook Street High School, yeah. um, is with us, Stephanie Rubin. But I'll just quickly set the context. And I don't know this history, frankly. Um, um, correct I'm, me if I'm wrong, Sue. This is, this is a bill that I think when Andy Perchlick said that this is something you all support. Oh, my goodness. We are so excited that you're even uh, taking testimony. Um, for the record, I'm Sue Minter. I'm the executive director of Capstone Community Action which is one of five community action agencies around the state focused on really ending poverty. We are nonprofit anti-poverty organizations established in the 1960s 
through the war on poverty, uh, the Johnson administration. So many of us are still around and we do everything from helping uh, address food insecurity. We have the largest uh, food shelf here in central Vermont. Capstone is serving um, the communities of Lamoille County, Washington County and Orange County and a couple of towns in Windsor. Not sure why. Um, we do weatherization, um, a topic that you're all familiar with, I think, um, the subsidized home weatherization program. We also do lie heat, people who come to us who don't have enough to stay warm all winter. So food security, warmth, um, housing supports, helping people get into homes uh, and stay there successfully. Uh, but really, we also try to lift people out of poverty through providing opportunities and tools for self-sufficiency. And one of the most fundamental, I call it the flagship program, is our Head Start. We serve in our regions 300 families in a variety of ways. Um, but the largest is our center-based early education program, which is located in Barry City, uh, the uh, Learning Together Center, uh, which has 65 kiddos uh, ranging from zero to, or whatever, birth to five, uh, helping them get into a school successfully. And these are very at-risk families. They are families who are homeless. 30% of the folks we serve in our Head Start, sadly, 30% are homeless. Um, they may have parents in substance use recovery. They may be in foster homes. Their parents may be incarcerated. These are kids with significant traumas. We also have at the top floor our Brook Street High School. It is connected to our Head Start Child Care Center because these are young moms who are choosing to carry their babes to term and drop out of high school. Many, if not most, will not return to high school. And this program is about helping them become great parents, helping make sure their students have Head Start, which is high quality early education. And most importantly, that these young women achieve their high school diploma. It is an extraordinary program. Um, I've only been at Head Start, uh, excuse me, at Capstone for five years. In the middle of our pandemic, the, the uh, deficits that we were running, and I won't get into it, but it had a lot to do with our child care subsidy and how we do that in Vermont. Um, we had a major gap. And this program was literally on the chopping block because it is a discretionary program. We don't have to do this. We choose to do this. And that's when I unearthed this statute, um, the statute Act 192 of uh, the session 2007 and 8. I don't know that history, but what I can tell you right now is we have a program that is keeping students who would otherwise never degree, get that degree, not only getting that degree, but they receive parenting support, um, they receive weekly clinical um, mental health support. Remember, these folks have probably endured a lot of trauma. Many of them are um, victims of abuse. Um, many of them want to achieve. We help them with their literacy skills. Um, we help them get career training. Many of them are now going on to post-secondary education. A tremendous, tremendous program uh, about which I have provided links and brochures uh, that you'll get in your email. Um, but it's very hard. Right now, I have to raise, for almost all of the programs I just mentioned to you, whether it's food security, our food shelf, um, our uh, community kitchen academy, a workforce development program, um, our heat, keeping people warm through winter, every one of these are deficit programs. So I have to raise philanthropic dollars. For this program, I have to raise anywhere from twenty to 40000 a year just to keep it going. And I'm committed to doing that. But if we can figure out whether the legislature can help us by getting more for the pu per pupil spending. I don't know why pregnant women would not receive 100% of the per pupil spending. Certainly we've heard from one of our sending schools that quote, capstone's a bargain. There are other specialized programs that sending schools have to uh, support their students in that are above the per pupil spending. So. We think this is a program worth committing to, and I thank you for considering uh, that. Not knowing any of the history, nor knowing really how much time uh, and admin time the program takes from the school side. So that's great. And I would say that even if, 
it sounds to me, and we've only heard a little bit today, but that the schools are still providing services. So it's not as though we're not giving 100%. It sounds like, though, some of it is going to this program, programs like yours, and a little bit staying in the public schools, again, not, not benefiting these women, but they are providing a service to them in another way. That's a little bit of what we're hearing. Well, you know, I think when the statute says, I think that the language is that that the district shall pay the teen parent education program 83%. Yeah. That means that they, by statute, cannot support us with more than that. And certainly we do work with the schools. Um, I'm sure the other programs, uh, specialized education programs, also are required to, to work with schools. And I just don't know if that limitation exists for other specialized education programs. Um, but when there is that limitation, we would love for it to be reconsidered and certainly to be on equal with what's being done for other specialized education. These are young women who are at risk to begin with, who have decided they can't go back to school. We're providing their education. We're getting them to get their high school diploma. We're helping them be great parents. Yeah. We're giving them a real chance for success. And I'm telling you, the generational poverty that we are trying in our best way to address through programs like this is really, really an important program. Do you want to say something? I would. Um, Mr. Francis is here. Hi, Sue. Jeff Hi. Um, let me start by saying I'm well familiar with the great work that Capstone yeah. does. And, yeah, you know, found myself in a position I really wanted to bring an awareness to the committee. Um, uh, and, the, and I was here in 2007, 2008 when this was worked out. Um, a, I think Sue's points about the great work they do are on point. B, while you were speaking, Sue, I called up the DCF uh, webpage for parent child centers, which was really the, the population of 15 centers that were being discussed back in 2007, 2008. And it's confusing to me a little bit because for Washington County, it says that the parent child center is family center of Washington County. So when you were speaking, the first thing that I thought of was that Capstone really has an apparently an augmentation to services in the area. If that's the case, I think the proposal becomes even more intriguing because we don't know what the relationship is between the public schools and the other 15 or 14 teen parent centers in the state in terms of how they work with students. So in your case, it seems to me, and I'm not knowledgeable on the on this um, topic. Uh, it seems like you provide like full, comprehensive wraparound services to these teenagers. I don't know what your relationship is with the public schools. I believe you when you say that public school officials might be saying they wish they could give you more money, and I don't know that it's you know if there's a constraint on that. That would be one <laughs> thing to look into. But the larger picture for me is what's the relationship on a statewide basis between the teen centers, parent, the parents, child centers, and the schools, because it may be that the original logic would hold in, term, in terms of what the payment would be. So I'd be happy to, I don't wanna thwart the progress that, um, that uh, Sue's making, but I also, and I also would be willing to work with whomever to dig into this further. I, I just don't know. Yeah, and I, I, I know that Stephanie is here and I know I just uh, if you don't have time, we can continue offline or something, but Stephanie has definitely reached out. It is my understanding that the 15 or so that used to exist have many of these have folded and I wonder if it's because they can't afford it. Uh, we work very closely with the Washington County Family Center or the Family Center of Washington County. Stephanie, are you able to join us? And I know you may have had some communication with them around this proposal. Sure, uh, can you hear me, Sue? Yeah, we can hear you, okay, we just can't absolutely. see Absolutely, I don't ahead. know if my camera's working. So um, there are only, let's see, I believe six programs like ours in the state now. Uh, we are the only one with a capstone, um, with a, 
uh, community yeah. action agency and you're correct, the other ones are with parent child centers, but I believe there are only five left who are running teen parent education programs. Um, and I have spoken to a few and I believe it's the same kind of relationship with the schools where um, our programs are providing almost all of the services to the students and uh, really the schools, I, I would say is more of a small kind of administrative piece. And, and we love teaming with them. All of our school districts that we work with are wonderful. Um, it, it's just the, the services um, are being provided here. And, and you, course, but you re communicate and work directly with the schools through this program. And do you report with them, Stephanie? Correct. So all of our students are enrolled in ascending school. So um, we work with them to establish credit needs. Uh, we would check in a few times a year with guidance counselors. We would report back on credits that are earned at the end of the year or help plan for, um, for graduation. We have a really unique, uh, I'd love for anyone to come visit. It's just down the road, but our, uh, and our students would love to visit you. And if you have time, and I know you don't, but uh, we have one uh, teacher who we think of as a unicorn uh, because she is certified in all of the, the, the um, disciplines. So she has one-on-one, -on -one, these are small teams. The maximum we have all together are 10 uh, and at any one time and students come and go when they have their babies, they take a break, they come back, their kids are enrolled at the childcare. You know, we do everything from parenting courses and financial planning and helping them get into post-secondary education. Um, and of course the mental health, so many services. But the point is um, we only really have one teacher plus Stephanie, the director. Uh, the kids um, have uh, teaching cooking nutrition and cooking classes here at Capstone's Community Kitchen Academy. Um, they are doing so financial education, many, many different kinds of programs. So I feel like they get a high school diploma and beyond and they get confidence in themselves and they feel that they have a home where they make sense. Um, which often, you know, they can't really find that same sort of community with their other high school friends necessarily. I, I'm just going to read, if it weren't for Brook Street High School, I would not have graduated and I would not be the success story I am today. This program has made me realize what I can do if I put my mind to it. <laughs> I mean, the testimonials are beautiful. They're on the website that you have the link for. So Here Williams has a question, please. So are these... Uh, are you connected to other parent-child centers at all? Because I think in Rutland we have them. And they, they do the similar things to what you do. I'm just wondering if it's a collaborative effort, if you're associated with one another. Stephanie, can you speak to that? Sure. I mean, I know um, Head Start as a larger program works closely <laughs> with our local parent-child center. Um, we do not, it uh, used to be when this, um, when we first started, there were monthly meetings with um, Parent Child Center TPE programs, which was wonderful. And uh, as the years went by, that that kind of um, stopped. So I've just been reestablishing connections with folks and asking them questions about how they're navigating funding. Thank you. I, I think this hasn't, maybe historically wasn't really seen as a, high school diploma, a full education program, but more like a social service. And um, I, I, I hope that it can be seen. I'm sure there is some work uh, that the school must do. Uh, again, I don't know how it works with other special education programs. I'm sure Jeff might be able to share more on that, but we just love that you're considering this um, legislation. Other questions for our weeks. Uh, if you would stick around just for a minute, can we, can we just get general thoughts on this and any impressions at this point while we have this mentor in the room? Please. My only thought is that it seems ostensibly to be a great thing, but I honestly, I don't feel as though I'm ready to vote because I don't feel like I understand it well enough. Yeah, no, I just wanted to get okay. a general, okay. yeah. I concur. It's really the you know what's the what's the rationale for the split, the current split versus the proposed split. Just it doesn't seem like we have the corporate knowledge. So it's really no uh, you know not 
distract you from what the program's accomplishing. That's, that's not the point. It's simply there, there must have been a, a logic. Now I look to at least I understand what the logic is. Uh, it felt like we got the logic when Senator Kirch like presented and we got the walkthrough. Uh, to remember? But I remember that it was logical. Is what I'm um, skipping them um, down. But or if you watch the testimony, please have Now we can have um, That's my record. <clears throat> yeah. The St. James anything you want to add or anything you would call? from uh, Senator Perslick's testimony. Um, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. I can't speak to Senator Perslick's testimony. I do just want to clarify that um, teen parent education programs are specifically defined in Title 16. And they may be part of a teen parent, or they may be part of a parent-child center, but they are not the same thing. So there are many parent-child centers in the state that do not have teen parent programs. And there are teen parent programs that exist outside of a parent-child center. They are just not the same. They are regulated by two different agencies. They, they may house one another or be in the same building or part of the same program, but the teen parent program itself is regulated by AOE. And so I think Ms. Rubin is accurate in the number of teen parent programs. Um, based on the information on AOE's website. And how many was that again? <clears throat> um, it looks like there's five specific teen parent programs and one, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, six, maybe, six. So six teen parent programs, we could pretty- we could No, six. Six yes. teen parent programs. Uh, like 16. Yeah, oh, I said yeah, six, yeah. no, it's not like six. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> six. Uh, sorry, 16 teen pregnancy <laughs> teen programs. Uh, we could reach out to them, we can get that information. Is that something you can help us with, Stephanie, around what person, you know, what some of the schools do basically for with those, that additional 17%? Yes, absolutely. I can, that would be really helpful to us. Sure. Well. Well, what I'm just wondering, because we are connected to the teen parent eds, and I think what you're trying to figure out is what is it that the schools need the 17% for? So I don't know if it might make sense for us to connect with our sending schools. Um, I, you know, I don't know, but we can certainly connect with the other teen parent ed programs. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, it makes, what I'm trying to do is get a sense of what it is the sending schools are using those dollars for. Okay. For that example, makes sense. Got if, it. it's, if it's something that they're basically doing for every other student, they may not need 17% of these funds. Does that make sense? You know, if it's, uh, but it would be interesting for us to kind of understand that. Senator Buick. I also might, another question would be, I think I heard that there, the, the number of teen ed programs have shrunk or was it the, oh wait, maybe it was the teen centers. The teen centers have shrunk. So we have fewer than we used to have. Did I hear that correctly? The teen parent education program, when it was started, I think I heard that there were something in the range of 15. Now there's only six. And I wonder if the inability to afford it is part of that, I don't know. Okay, that my question is, is it an affordability question or is it the fact that, uh, the, the need is not as great as it used to be. I guess I would want clarification on that. We have Senator Perslick here who's going to join us uh, at the table. Thanks for coming down, Senator Perslick. We know right now you're busy funding our requests in the budget. Yeah. Uh, but we're, we, we want to just, we're looking at S117. Sorry. Uh, we, we want to be helpful here. We're a helpful group of people. Yeah. But what we're trying to understand is the genesis of that 83% that split, when it happened, why it happened. Are we, would we be taking public dollars from public schools that are providing service to some of these kids still, even though they're, they're being educated in this other spot? Right. So can you help us out a little bit? I think as far as your first question, uh, Councilor St. James might be the best answer, like where it came from, because when I did the bill request, 
Watch, I couldn't find this exception for a long time. And then Council St. James found it in okay. the session law part of a, a bill from, I don't know, when. So you might want to hear some of the history. And I think, uh, I don't want to speak for her, but she was also perplexed of why it was where it was that it, that it survived in session law for so long. Um, I think, I guess the question for me when I heard about it and why I put it in the bill was, are those sending schools providing services to the students? I was looking at mainly from the pregnant teen schools point of view of all the services they're providing, yeah. but by getting less money than a school <laughs> that would, or other, like if you just sent your child from ascending town to a public school, you would get 100%, right. Right. Um, but they're only getting that. Yeah. Less than 100%. So we asked Sue and Stephanie to reach out to sending schools to help us understand exactly that. And we'll see what they say. And if they say, gosh, what we're still doing, yeah. XYZ, this, we're counting on these dollars, we'll let you know. Yeah. Okay. Sue, does that make sense? Stephanie, you can help us with that. Maybe come back in the next day. Yes, absolutely. All right. So if we could just get a sense, since there are six programs, what those sending schools are doing, that would be would be great. As many as you can. Okay, will do. All right, Hayden will be back in touch and we'll uh, have you in tomorrow or Friday. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I know that Brad's Yeah, Sue? I just don't know if Stephanie is gonna be able to reach all of those sending schools for those different programs in the next Two days, like I'm I think, not. I think we, we might have a volunteer. Yeah. Um. So I I I, I w would like to see this brought to a constructive end. So I'll help and however um I. Thank can. you. So I'm gonna. I'm sure your email is online. I'll send you an email right now about how to connect on this. Yeah, and Hayden, you can forward the information I just shared with you all. Thank you, Hayden, for fitting all that in. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it because we don't know the answer either, and. We sure want to keep this this program growing. It's it, it is a life changer for these students. I've seen it. I've witnessed it, and it's really hard for me to keep raising private philanthropic dollars for programs that are getting kids their high school diplomas. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. And there was there was another part of the bill about when the students are on maternity leave. Yes. So I didn't know if that was also something you were addressing. That seems like if the sending school sent, you know, if you're sending a child to another school and they're, they get mono and they're out for four months, they still get 100% they don't deduct that yeah. money. So a program that has higher costs that should not be penalized, penalized for providing that maternity care. Right, right. Yeah, I think our, our question really lies in the Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for looking at the settings. Absolutely. Thank you for everything you're doing to make sure the appropriations <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I got a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll be texting them. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for Senator Perslick about this transportation? Is it perch lick or perch lick? <laughs> Depends on who you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are you going to hear from Councilor St. James about the origins? Because I was listening in. But... St. James, do you want to join us again and tell us a little bit about uh, the genesis of this? Sure. Uh, if there's not much that I'm able to speak to. So, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. This language first appeared in the budget in 2008. It's stayed there since then. It's the only place that exists. So prior um, to that, sorry, mm -hmm. prior to that, it was 100% or prior to that? Uh, so this, um, this language is not amending anything. So okay. I think there can be an assumption, but I have not done any legislative research. Yeah, yeah. Um, and frankly, because it was a part of the budget, there's likely very little. Um, uh, I can't guarantee that there was a policy robust committee discussion like you all have and therefore a nice trail of legislative history, um, but I have not done that research. Um, but no, this language isn't amending anything. So it was creating that split. Um, I think you heard testimony from Brad James that he was around when this language was crafted mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't much more to it than 
this is part of the budget in 2008 and during recession, during a difficult time. Um, you know, okay. I think the, the language as it applies to tuitioning districts may be illustrative of the intent behind the split. It's spelled out a little more clearly for uh, a tuitioning district versus a non-tuitioning district, but the split is the same. Um, but I, there's there's not much not much to the history. Okay. Any questions for Beth? Okay. Thanks. So we'll wait to hear back from folks uh, hopefully tomorrow or Friday. And thank you, Mr. Francis. Uh, so we have something coming up at 2.30, but let's just take five minutes and I'll, we can come back and I can give you an update on a 